Hi everyone, welcome back to Lunchbox Science from the University of Sydney. Welcome back to our regular Lunchbox crew and to those of you who are joining us for the first time. We're diving into a bit of an aquatic lunch today. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to this and I hope you are too. Um, if you do have any questions for today's expert, you can submit those via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. Now, it is my absolute privilege to introduce to you Dr. Rachel Gray. So I'm going to get her up on our screen for you. Now, Rachel is a veterinary graduate from the University of Sydney with a passion for marine mammals, especially pinnipeds. So these are our fin-footed friends, the seals and sea lions. And after graduating, Rachel worked as a small animal vet in Australia and the UK uh, before commencing a PhD investigating the health status of leopard and Weddell seals in Antarctica. What a PhD project. I reckon I can feel a surge of jealousy, Rachel, just <laughs> emerging from people's living rooms as they think of a trip to Antarctica right now. Although it's winter, be cold, terrible, terrible stuff. Terrible. You're much better in your living room. Okay. She's currently, um, Rachel, our Dr. Rachel Gray here is currently a senior lecturer in veterinary pathology in the Sydney School of Veterinary Science. And she undertakes research in marine mammals, seabirds, and other native species. And her research focus is health and disease investigations and the impacts of toxicants, including heavy metals, on wildlife health. So now I would like to hand over to Rachel for our session today on saving the Australian sea lion. Thanks very much, Rachel. Thanks very much, Eugenia. Thank you very much for that welcome, Eugenia, and for organising this alongside with Cass. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, saving the Australian sea lion and specifically talking about treating pups um, for a really common um, parasitic infection that causes quite a lot of disease as well as mortality or death in these puppies. And first I'd like to thank um, my PhD students that have worked a lot on this um, material. So Scott Lindsay, Shannon Taylor and Marielle Fulham who are working on the Australian Sea Lion Project. And also I'd like to thank the Department for Environment and Water who, do, who have provided us more recently with some funding to support this work. And for all of the staff at Seal Bay Conservation Park that have made this work possible. So let's get into talking about the sea lion. So you may not know that the Australian sea lion is Australia's only endemic pinniped species, and it has a really low population size. The pup production per breeding cycle is only about two and a half thousand pups across the entire range. And the population is estimated at between about 10,000 and 12,000 individuals. Um, because of this low number and because of other features and threats of this population, it is actually recognized by the International Union Conservation of Nature as endangered. And it is also listed as vulnerable under Australian federal legislation. Um, it has quite a limited distribution. I should just turn this off. Excuse me for one second. Sorry about that. Um, so it's got a limited distribution from the Hoopman Abrolis in um, Western Australia around to the pages in South Australia. Prior to sealing, which happened in the 18th and the 19th centuries, um, it was believed that the Australian sea line did actually extend into Bass Strait, but obviously post sealing that has not, um, that has been limited. So the Australian sea lion is really unique and particularly with its reproductive history. And unfortunately, the reproductive history means that it also um, is limiting the recovery of this population from that, pre that um, historical ceiling. So they are what we call non-annual um, breeders and they only breed every 17 to 18 months. And this is very different to other pinnipeds who breed annually. The breeding pupping occurs over about a five to nine month period. So pups can be born any time over that five to nine month period 
And then there's a really huge maternal investment for these puppies. Unlike some of the fossid seals, which are the ones that we find um, more in Antarctica and in the Arctic, which only have really short lactation periods, you know, from days to weeks. Um, the Australian sea lion female actually um, lactates for their puppy for 15 to 18 months, basically just before she gives birth again, she will still be feeding her pup. Breeding is also asynchronous across the range. So for example, we've got the two main colonies we're working at is Seal Bay here on Kangaroo Island and Dangerous Reef. And there's about 76 other colonies where breeding occurs and they are asynchronous. So at any one time, there could be Australian sea lions breeding and pupping at any of these colony sites. The other thing that the Australian sea lions have is extreme natal site fidelity. And that basically means um, that the mums will return to where they were born to give birth. And so that means that it is very difficult for this population to spread out and to inhabit new areas because they have this um, need to come back to where they're actually born. The other deleterious thing about this population is that they have a high but quite variable pup mortality. And it depends on whether it's a winter breeding season or a summer breeding season and what colony we're talking about. So for example, Seal Bay, where we're doing our treatment trial, um, the mortality ranges from about nine to 37% and the population is declining at about 2.3% of decreased pup production per 17 to 18 months. And that's pretty significant when you consider um, the actual low population size. Um, at Dangerous Reef, which is this colony here, which is in Spencer Gulf, also in South Australia, the um, mortality rate varies between 14 to 45%, but this population is actually increasing, which is, which is great for the population. Now, what are the threats to the population recovery? And we talk about a recovery in the Australian sea lion rather than, um, and also a decline, but basically we're talking about recovery from that historical harvesting that occurs, which we know reduce the population as well as reduce the dis distribution of the population in um, Australia. So they have a small genetically fragmented population. And in the past, they've had quite a lot of fisheries interactions. Now, a lot of this has been mitigated by work um, from the Department of um, Department for Environment and, and um, Water in South Australia, as well as Saudi Aquatic Sciences. They've done a lot of work with fisheries interactions. Tourism is also known to be a stressor in populations. We've done some work on pollution and particularly looking at heavy metals such as mercury, as well as persistent organic pollutants. And some work from a PhD stu student, Shannon Taylor, is currently looking at the higher levels of these um, toxicants in the Australian sea lion pups. And another PhD student, Mario Fulham, is also looking at human associated um, bacteria and bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. And we are detecting that in this species as well. One of the threats um, that I'm obviously gonna talk about is disease. And particularly we're talking about hookworm in pups. Now, all of these things seem to be um, difficult to manage. We obviously can't change the genetic fragmentation of the population. There has been work done on fisheries interactions. Tourism is ongoing and is a positive for um, the population in terms of awareness. Um, it's difficult to control pollution and obviously the presence of, um, this is essentially another anthropogenic or human associated effect, difficult to control. But we can actually have an impact on disease and particularly this hookworm in pups. And as you can see, these, these pups are beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm a bit biased, but I do think they are one of the most beautiful pinnipeds that um, we have, and we, we have them in, in Australia, so we're very lucky. So what do we know about hookworm disease? Well, we know it occurs in 100% of pups, and I'll talk to you about the life cycle in a moment. The thing about hookworm in Australian sea lions is that the pups have really high infection intensity, which means they've got a lot of adult worms um, in their intestinal tract. And we know that high infection intensity seasons correspond to the high mortality seasons and vice versa. So we are pretty, pretty confident that it is a significant pathogen um, in this population. If you have a look at this picture here, this is worms and you can see an individual worm is about two to two and a half centimeters long. This was worms from just one single puppy when we flushed its intestinal tract after it, it had unfortunately succumbed to hookworm disease. Um, they are called hookworms because this is its mouth or its buccal capsule. And basically this buccal capsule burrows into this intestinal tract. So this is the wall of the intestine. And what you can see here is all these profiles of these hookworms. And you can see that it burrows directly into that wall and that causes damage to the intestinal wall, which makes it difficult for the intestine to absorb all the nutrients that the animals require. 
and it also causes this area of inflammation as well as hemorrhage. So basically what we see with hookworm, oh, sorry, I'll talk about the life cycle first so that you can understand why we have this 100% prevalence. So we might start, um, we might start with here. Um, so pups are born and basically what happens is the L3 or the, the L3 larvae basically pass from the mum's milk to the pup within the first 24 to 48 hours of birth. Um, these develop into adult hookworms in the pup intestinal tract and then the eggs from those worms, once they start to reproduce, which happens at about day 11 to 14 after birth, are shed in the faeces. In the environment, these worms um, develop from their egg into these larvae and the smart thing about this parasite is those larvae can then invade the skin of any age cohort of sea lion and other species as well. And basically they then lay dormant in the um, cutaneous tissue and also in the blubber of the seals. Now what happens is just prior to when the, when the, when the mum is due to give birth, those um, dormant larvae will become activated and basically they will then migrate to the mammary glands and that's how they get into the milk for the pups to ingest. And the thing about these free living stages that are in the environment is they can survive for four to eight years in the right environmental conditions and they can also survive for a really long period of time in the animal's body when they're dormant. So that's why we have this really high prevalence of infection. So what does it actually cause? Um, this picture is just showing a piece of the intestinal tract. Um, you can see that there's, hopefully you can appreciate, there's these red areas here which are areas of hemorrhage. And these are all the worms in the intestinal tract. And as you can imagine, um, when you get all these worms present, they cause damage when they attach to that intestinal um, wall and we get inflammation. And the result of that that we actually see is bloody diarrhea. Um, you can see here, when, remember we mentioned that hook or that buckle capsule? And this is actually shown, this is a really, really cool picture showing this hook actually wrapping around a little bit of the mucosa of the intestinal tract and causing a lot of damage, breaking down the protein, um, causing hemorrhage and inflammation. So if you can imagine, say this is what, 30 worms just in this one little area, 30 sites of this, you can imagine that it is going to cause quite a lot of problems in terms of absorbing nutrients and a lot of damage to that wall. So we get bloody diarrhea and that results in loss of protein and nutrients in the intestinal tract as well as losing protein and nutrients, we lose a lot of blood. And that's why these animals have anemia. Because they have anemia, which is basically a reduced amount of red blood cells to carry oxygen in the blood, they become quite lethargic. Because they're losing protein, they experience quite a lot of weight, weight loss, and they also experience reduced growth. Now, the thing that we know about neonatal animals is that um, the period of growth and the amount of weight and stuff they put on in that early neonatal period is really important for their fitness and survival as they get older. So having this really um, significant disease early in life can actually have impacts way beyond that um, pup period. The other thing that happens is that because these pups are more lethargic, um, they're weak, they actually have a lot of trouble um, getting away from um, what we call conspecific trauma. So unfortunately, trauma is the most common cause of pup death in this um, population. And that's basically considered to be due to misdirected aggression by the adult males. And basically, if you have weak and lethargic pups, they can't get away from those aggressive males and many of them experience trauma and die as a result of that. And from what we know, we think that hookworm contributes to about 40% of pup mortality in this population. And as I mentioned before, pup mortality is high, so the contribution of hookworm is pretty high as well. So we've got a disease that causes hemorrhage, um, and it causes hemorrhage externally. So what, should be, what would normally happen in an animal that has hemorrhage? Now, this is a very crude graph that I put together, um, and we measure the number of red blood cells by what we call this packed cell volume. And it's basically, um, think of it as the proportion of red blood cells to the liquid component of the blood. Now what happens when animals lose blood in whatever fashion is that we get a reduction in this PCV. And if that blood loss continues, we eventually get to this point where these animals do not have enough oxygen to survive, okay? So animals that have a really high intensity 
get really oftentimes quite acute infection with high intensity, basically they will get to a point where they don't have enough oxygen capacity. If we treat an animal with hookworm, and this is just showing an example of giving an animal um, the treatment, um, what should happen is the treatment will knock off those parasites in the intestinal tract really quite quickly within sort of 48 hours. And then if the pup has enough capacity, enough nutrients, it will actually restore, I'm trying to get my mouse here, sorry, restore that PCB to normal. Okay, so that's what we're hoping to achieve with treatment. If we don't treat the animals, we will continue to lose um, blood. The important thing to also remember, however, is that um, pups do shed this um, infection at about two to three months of age naturally. What's important though, is that before two to three months of age, a lot of the pups will die. So that's why we've been, we've been talking about what options we have um, in terms of treating these animals. So what can we actually do about hookworm infection? So as I've alluded to, we can actually treat hookworm infection and we can treat it using a really commonly used anti-parasitic drug called ivermectin. There are a lot of other types of drugs that are very similar, different names. Um, we've chosen ivermectin because that was used in a couple of other species in the Northern Hemisphere to treat hookworm in um, otarid pups, which are the, the, the fur seals and the sea lions. Now, what we've done in the past, in 2011 and 2013, as part of a PhD student's project, um, Alan Marcus, we administered ivermectin by injection under the skin in pups at Dangerous Reef in Spencer Gold. So that was one of those sites I showed you on the map. What we were able to determine was that ivermectin was a safe drug, so we saw no adverse effects of administering this drug, and it was nearly 98% effective in clearing hookworm infection in the treated pups. We were able to show that pups had less anemia when they were treated and that their parameters of health were improved, but we weren't actually able to demonstrate any changes or any effect on growth rate, so the weight of the pups and the length of the pups was not, not significantly different between the treated and non-treated pups. And we also weren't able to demonstrate improvements in survival. Now, largely we know that was due to some logistical constraints. Dangerous Reef is a really difficult place to work at. Um, you have to get a charter boat out to there. It's really hard to land on the island, really high density of animals. And there's also a couple of outer reefs that we believe many of the puppies move to um, when they were getting older and so we couldn't actually re recite those animals and confirm that they were surviving the infection. What we particularly learned from this first trial was that we need to treat pups early and we're talking at less than two weeks of age to actually see improved growth rate and survival. We saw improvement in their sort of health parameters but we weren't able to see that improvement in, in growth rate and survival which obviously is what we need to see to validate this as a, as a useful treatment. And we also were wondering, is there anything we can do to more minimally invasively treat these animals so that there's less impact on the pups? Obviously, you know, veterinarians can give injections, other people can give injections, but we wanted to know if we could actually use a topical application to treat hookworm in these pups. Obviously, topical um, ivermectin and other drugs are used commonly in other species. Ivermectin is basically a type of drug that is used in some of the topical applications or top spots um, we use in animals, and it's been used in cattle and sheep. So we wanted to know that in an aquatic animal, quite a bit of a challenge in terms of applying a topical drug, whether we could be successful. So we did a topical ivermectin treatment trial at Dangerous Reef um, in 2017. And in this time, we basically had um, three treatment groups. We had a topical application of the drug. We, we compared the injectable application, which we knew also worked, and then we had a no treatment group. We treated pups that were less than 70 centimetres in length and, if possible, less than 10 kilos in weight. And we knew that approximated a pup that was less than two weeks of age. Um, because the Australian sea lion is born over such a long period of time, that five to nine month period, we don't have a great estimate of the age of pups. And so we basically use the length of the pups as a proxy. So in this trial, we actually treated 90 pups um, that were less than two weeks of age. And we caught the pups on two subsequent occasions, about two weeks apart. And then we compared the health parameters, the indicators of growth and the short-term survival of those pups between the groups. Don't freak out about all these, I'll explain them. They're not as complicated as perhaps they look. So basically what we're seeing here 
is the comparison of the results for the treatment groups, and that's either the topical or injected um, formulations, versus the pups that weren't treated. And what we're looking at here on the y-axis is the change in this parameter from capture one, and on the x-axis for each of these graphs, we have the value of capture one, capture two, and capture three. This first plot is showing an increase in growth rate or increase in the standard length of the pups. We're also looking at increase in the weight of the pups. And finally, we're looking at um, that PCV, so the increase in the red blood cell number. And what we're really able to demonstrate is that yes, we saw significant differences in the growth rate, both the standard length and weight, and in this health measure um, between the treatment and control groups. And that basically both the topical and the injectable formulations were as effective as each other. So here you can see, if you can see the steepness of this graph, really much steeper in that first capture period, recapture period, compared to the second recapture period. And what's that, what that is telling us is that the effect is really most effective, or the um, capacity of the drug to eliminate hookworm and allow pups to recover from anemia is most effective when the pups are younger. And we see the same thing, a similar thing here with the pack cell volume. We see a steeper incline early on and then it sort of tails off. Interestingly, the animals that aren't treated, they still do recover if they actually survive that original decrease. Because you can see over time in that first period, while both the topical and the injectable formulations result in an increase in that red cell mass, the control pups are still decreasing their pack cell volume. But there were, while there were some good outcomes of that pilot study, um, we did have some limitations. So we were able to show that we did have, with early treatment of pups, less than two weeks of age, we did have improvements in growth rate, both in the standard length and in the um, weight of the pups. And apologies, there's a helicopter landing at RPA at the moment, I think. Um, so it might be a little bit um, noisy, apologies for that. Can't do much about it. Um, treatment also, when early, um, improves the health measures of pups. And when I talk about the health measures, I'm talking about those that we know is directly impacted by hookworm. And again, we are able to show that topical ivermectin was safe and effective, and as safe and effective as the injectable formulation. So there were real positives. However, that trial was limited by the small sample size. And we were really only able to evaluate a really short-term treatment impact, um, less than only at two pups um, for about six weeks of age because of the three captures two weeks apart. So while we saw some really positive results, we still felt that we needed to know a little bit more about what was going on. So we then we decided to do a trial at Seal Bay, and I'll, I'll discuss the reasons why for that. And we had um, several aims in terms of using that seal bay population. So in terms of the short-term aims, we really wanted to quantify the impact of hookworm disease on those parameters of health. And we wanted to see how effective the topical application was on a greater sample size and across both winter and summer breeding seasons. They are very different breeding seasons at this site very different pup mortality, different environmental conditions. And so it's really important if we're looking at this as a potential management um, application in the future, we really need to know what the effect is of this um, intervention between the summer and winter periods of time. Now in the long term, if we're trying to use this as a method of improving um, population, improving the recovery, we basically need to get more animals. And in order to do that, we're trying to increase pup survival and seeing if that actually translates to increased recruitment of animals to that breeding population. Now, the other thing that is impacting the recovery of the Australian sea lion is that um, the age at which animals reproduce is quite, um, I guess I'd say old, not human-wise, but in terms of um, pinnipeds. So females um, breed between, at the first time between four to six years of age, Whereas males, while they can breed um, at eight to nine years of age, they usually are only able to maintain um, female relationships. I'm not sure how to say it. Um, they, there's a lot of competition to mate um, females. And usually it's not until the boys are about 12 to 14 of age that they can actually stand their ground and actually mate. So we've got this really long period of time 
um, before these animals are mature and able to actually mate. And so that means if we're trying to work out if increasing pup survival improves that recruitment and improves the population, we need to really look at this in a long-term fashion. It's not just an 18 month breeding season or two breeding seasons. We really are looking at a commitment for sort of, you know, six to 10 years to actually see if we're having an impact of this intervention. So in order to demonstrate this, and this, this, this image is of Seal Bay. It's a really amazing, beautiful location. It's on Kangaroo Island. Um, hopefully when um, things in the world um, change, to a little bit more like normal. If anyone does get the opportunity to go to Kangaroo Island and to visit Seal Bay Conservation Park, it's an amazing place, um, an amazing opportunity to see um, a population in the wild. So what do we need to actually achieve these goals? So we need a larger sample size. Um, Seal Bay is an ideal place to work. Um, it is on Kangaroo Island, which is you know, off the coast, but obviously it's much more logistically feasible than going to a population such as Dangerous Reef which is about an hour's charter boat from Port Lincoln. Um, really high population density. The only thing on there is a very small lighthouse. And so it's really rough camping. Um, and you can't spend extended periods of time on that island because the impact on the population is, is too great. So we've decided to work at Seal Bay um, because we can use a larger sample size. We can get long-term follow-up of survival. So because um, at that site, there is individual animal identification, which is permanent, and that's mediated through in insertion of microchips. Um, we can actually follow individual an animals from really early neonatal period to weaning, which occurs at about 18 months of age, and then to breeding. And I guess I'm just talking about females at this stage, but six plus years. Um, because it is a bit more accessible than some, some of the other colonies, um, we can access the colony more frequently, and that means we can do this recapturing and get these health impacts and also monitor environmental impacts as well. And because we can access the place a bit more readily, we can do mortality investigations. And that's in aid of trying to quantify the role of hookworm in this mortality. Um, the monitoring program is basically run by the Department for Environment and Water and the South Australian Research and, Dis um, and Development Institute. And that's been running for, for many years now. And it's a really key um, data set that is essential to this, to this overall population recovery. So what is our study design? So basically, um, we have pups. So we catch a pup that we find in the colony. And basically, there's a randomization metric and a pup will either receive ivermectin. I, hopefully you can appreciate we've, we've made these pups slightly blue because ivermectin is blue or they receive no treatment. So this is the topical treatment group. This is the um, no treatment group. Then about a month later, we'll try to recapture that pup. Subsequent recapture another month later, then another month later. Now these recapture threes can be really quite challenging um, because the pups are pretty big, pretty wily by that stage. They're in the water um, and they can be quite difficult to recapture. But, um, and that's another reason why it's important that we do try to catch pups um, that are about less than two weeks old because then we probably are still able to capture them when they're about three to four months old um, rather than the bigger pups which are really hard to get at that stage. And because we have um, this microchipping program, we can do survival follow-up to weaning, which is 18 months of age, and then ongoing to breeding. And as I mentioned, well, any pups that are found dead in the colony, we try to collect and try to determine the cause of mortality. So what do we actually do with the puppies? So um, we catch a puppy and basically if it's a treatment pup, we apply this ivermectin, just we very gently part the fur and apply the ivermectin directly onto the pup's um, skin. Exactly the same as you apply a top spot to your dog or to your cat. Now what we need to know is we need to be able to visualize from quite a distance to reduce the impact. And this is probably looking a little bit strange here. Um, what we do is we apply a bleach mark. So we do a unique um, haircut in each of the puppy's back ends, um, and then we bleach that. And we can then visualize these from many um, meters away, which means that if we see a pup in the colony, we can recognize and say, no, we don't need, this one's actually um, 12. We don't need 12. Um, he can stay off with his mum. And so we apply these bleach marks, a unique one for every puppy. 
Um, and basically when these animals ma uh, molt at about five to six months of age, that bleach mark disappears. And then from then on, we're relying on the microchip. And we do use this beautiful Nordic blonde bleach. So it's a, what's it called? Nine, nine levels of lift. Um, and these bleach marks do look rather nice. Um, so Schwarzkopf wants to um, advertise maybe, you know, I think a puppy would look fantastic on this picture. She looks lovely, but I'm sure a puppy would look great. Um, so we might need to consider that in the future. So we apply bleach marks first, and then we use the microchips. And what do we do? Well, we collect some blood, and that's to basically assess the response to infection um, of the pups. So we collect bloods from the puppy. We collect bloods to also look at toxicant analysis. So we can use the blood sample that we collect to also look at heavy metal concentrations. And we also collect fur, that haircut that we do. We don't just leave that um, hair in the colony. We actually collect that hair and we can also do toxicant analysis on that as well. And then we also collect faecal swabs because obviously we need to know, is our treatment working? So the way we determine that is by collecting a, a sample of poo, um, should I say feces, um, from the pup's rectum. Um, and we use that to, or to make a smear and see if we see those eggs present. Um, and we also, um, one of the projects I mentioned before, looking at um, human associated bacteria. So this, set, we get a, another subsample and that is applied for E. coli, um, which is a bacteria phylotyping. So to work out whether the bacteria are human associated or whether they're um, normal, normally associated with marine mammals. And then at about four to five months of age, basically that's when we stop doing our sampling and then basically we scan the microchips in the colony to determine if the pups are still alive or if they're not. And hopefully if we can do that monthly till the pups are about 18 months of age when they'll be weaned, then hopefully we will find these amazingly chubby um, juvenile animals that are going on to um, join the reproductive population, we hope. So how did we go? So we did this work at the 2019 breeding season at Seal Bay. Um, we were able to sample 206 of the 228 pups born, and we recruited 160 of those to our study, of which gratuitously, but I guess that's how randomization works, 80, 80 of them were treated and 80 were controlled. Our recapture visit, obviously recapture was pretty successful early on, and as the pups got older, it got more difficult. Um, to recapture them. Um, but after six trips, our recapture rate was about 91%, which is pretty amazing. And fantastically, the um, treatment effectiveness of ivermectin was 100%. So that was really wonderful to see. These images are just showing us um, applying, doing the haircut, um, collecting the fur there, also um, applying the ivermectin. And this is us in our makeshift lab, which is in a, um, a shed at someone's property who has very generously let us use their shed. Um, and we're doing all our blood analysis in the evenings. And this is just showing a beautiful puppy with its mum and looking, looking pretty happy there. And that's the outcome of what we want for treatment. So what have we been able to show? So basically, I won't go into too much detail of these, but you can see again on, on the y-axis here, we have the weight of the pup and this is the length of the pup. We have the control puppies, so the ones that aren't treated are in the pale blue, and then the tealy colour is the treatment pups. And as you can see that in both groups that we had, the, the younger pups, less than 70 centimetres, and the, the larger pups, we did have a increase in weight. It wasn't actually significant, significantly different. Both groups did increase in weight, um, but very, very good in terms of, you can see the treatment pups do increase more compared to the non-treatment pups. We did see a significant difference in the increase in the length of the puppies in the smaller age group. So the less than 70 centimetre pups, significant difference in the length between the control and the treated pups. We didn't see that difference in the larger animals that we sampled. In terms of the pack cell volume, so remember that red blood cell mass, um, what we saw was a significant difference um, in the treatment pups versus the control pups from capture one to capture two. So this is the PCV, this is the control pups, these are the treatment pups. This time this is capture one, so the mean pack cell volume at capture one and at capture two. And there was actually a significant improvement in that PCV and the treated pups um, in both the smaller pups, so the less than 70 centimetre pups, 
and the greater than 70 centimetre pups. So that's, that's a great outcome because increasing the PCV increases the pup's oxygen capacity, means that they're probably more resilient, more active, more able to escape um, from any conspecific trauma that they might experience. And the other thing we're talking about here is when I talk about losing nutrients through the intestinal tract, one of the things we can measure is the total protein value. And these plots are showing the total plasma protein, which is another blood parameter in control versus treated pups. Um, this is in the smaller pups, less than 70 centimeters. This is in the larger pups. And you can see that for all, all of them, there was a significant difference between captures one and two. Um, and that would make sense if we're seeing what, what we can't actually demonstrate is that obviously the pups that um, don't have improvements are probably pups that we're finding dead in the colony. And so we do expect to see all of those um, groups to have an increase. Um, we probably would have thought though that the treated pups maybe had a greater increase than the um, untreated pups, but that really only seems to be the case um, for the, the pups that are greater than 70 centimeters. And finally, what we can see here, so this is the result of all four recaptures that we did over that period of time. And I think we ended up doing over 560 captures in total. So it was a massive commitment on, on the part of our field team. And we've got the percentage change here of both weight and length. And as you can see, the treated pups that were less than two weeks of age, their weight gain was 123% of their original and their standard length gain was about 31%. In the control pups that were less than two weeks, while they did increase in both um, weight and length, you can see that here, um, it was signif significantly less increase compared to those treated pups. And in pups that were treated but were bigger, um, again, while we saw an increase in their weight and their length, it was significantly less than what was observed in those treated populations. So where to now? So this is basically what we're up to now. So we did this, um, we did this um, winter low mortality breeding season at Seal Bay, which ran from May 2019 to January 2020, so a really long time. We caught 160 pups. We were aiming for 180, but basically there was only 160 pups available when you took out um, the pups that had died. And at this point in time, we're up to the monthly microchip scanning for survival. Um, and because of COVID, we are unable to travel to South Australia. So our colleagues and collaborators at Seal Bay Conservation Park, um, particularly Mel Stonnell, are doing the microchip scanning for us at this point in time and collecting that data, which we greatly appreciate. In November 2020, we will basically try to determine the survival to, re to weaning of the pups that we recruited for our study in 2019. So that's gonna be really exciting in November to actually get that overall survival data. Then it all starts again, December 2020, running to about July 2021. We will be then doing the same study um, over a summer high mortality season. And obviously we will get the same um, information. And then in about July 2022, we should have the survival of that cohort um, to weaning, so that's about 18 months of age. Now I did mention it was a long-term project. Um, in May 2025 and then in December 2026, we will actually be able to determine the survival of these two cohorts to six years of age. Um, and that's when the females are usually recruited to the reproductive population. So it is a really long-term project. We can obviously see some really positive outcomes early on, but in order to see the real impact, are we getting improved survival translating to recruitment? Um, it's a long-term issue. Um, so that's about all I wanted to say, and I've gone over time, so I apologise. Um, I've acknowledged most of the people I wanted to mention earlier on. Um, I do want to mention um, Simon Goldsworthy at, at Sardi and obviously the Jew staff who are amazingly supportive of us. Um, BPDS, which is the lab that we do our work with, and Christine, amazing support and funding, we've received recent funding, as I said, for the Department for Environment and Water, South Australia, um, and the Herman Slade Foundation, as well as um, Sydney School of Veterinary Science Bequest have supported all of this work. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, does anyone have any questions? 
Thank you so much, Dr. Rachel Gray. That no was worries. absolutely fantastic. I've oh, thank you. learned so much in a very short uh, time frame. So. Oh, good. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> We've had some fantastic questions coming through. Oh, so awesome. I might um, kick off with a few of these. And I do apologise if we don't get to all of your questions, but we will make sure Dr. Gray sees your questions um, as well so she knows what you're asking. Yeah. But, um, quite a few questions surrounding the ivermectin treatment. Um, yeah. So if that's okay, we might chat a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, so there's... Um, how long does the ivermectin need to remain in contact? There's a question from Rebecca regarding that um, and a few other people as well. Yeah. So how long does it need to remain in contact? Um, and, you know, where exactly is it applied? Um, yeah. Sort of this yeah, area pretty, on me yeah, yeah. is what I would gather. But um, yeah. So we do try to apply it um, between the, basically between the scapulas in the neck. So basically behind the neck and that's basically so pups can't access it exactly what we do with with cats and dogs we try to apply it somewhere where they can't access it the great thing and you know one of the big risks about using topical as i said these are aquatic animals um, if these animals go in the water we may as well forget it um, and that's why using the younger animals or the less than two week old um, animals is really important because they're not going into the water. The pups don't go into the water until they're about two to three months of age. And so targeting this younger, um, targeting, targeting the younger animals means that um, it shouldn't rub off. What we also worked out was when we part the fur and apply the ivermectin, when we, we sort of do a bit of a try to put the fur back together, completely dry underneath in that skin. So even if this, the animals were in the rain prior to us catching them, and we were a little bit reluctant in the first place to treat anything that was wet, um, when you part the fur, and this is the part of their insulative capacity, I guess, you part, you, you part the fur, the skin is completely dry. Um, in terms of contact time, less than um, 24 hours is plenty, and usually it's absorbed within about four to six hours across the skin. Um, okay. wow. So. The main things we have to be really careful of is we just, we were very, very careful in this first season just to make sure that we didn't sample pups that were really wet. But thankfully we discovered that their pelage, their fur is so wonderful anyway, because it's supposed to be insulative and, and great for the water. Um, so we weren't actually concerned in the end by the contact time or the animal being wet. And largely it's because they're not going into the water at this age. And when they are that little, the, the age we're trying to treat them, they're often in caves protected from the weather anyway. So um, really great question, but we managed to work out that it's probably not a, not a big risk in terms of them not getting the dose. And you may have sort of touched on the answer here for this question as well, but um, a really interesting one from Emma. Um, do you have any concerns of like the environmental impact of ivermectin on, for example, other aquatic species um, and also you know, I guess given its slow degradation time. Um, yep. And just another point to that, um, do you have any concerns that there might be resistance to ivermectin in the future um, with the, the pups um, receiving this treatment and then becoming resistant to it? Yeah, absolutely. So those questions are all things that we addressed, um, not only in our thinking of designing the project, but also in um, our ethics application. So we actually calculated the volume of ivermectin that we would be applying and determined the parts per million in the water that we would actually be ending up with really, really tiny. It breaks down really quickly in sunlight. Um, and, but yes, it is, the metabolites are degraded. They come out through the feces and they will be in the environment. But we did determine that the actual volume that we would use, so we're talking less than 90 mils in total for a whole trial, um, was minimal and would not impact the environment. And when you think that these drugs have been used for many, many years in all our domestic species, you know, cattle, everything, there's a lot of um, of this drug out there already. Not that that justifies it, but we certainly did work out um, how much would be going into the environment. And in terms of resistance, we did a lot of reading in terms of what is recommended. And basically they say, if you don't treat more than 50% of the population, it is very unlikely that resistance will develop. Um, so that was one thing that we looked into. So that's why we have chosen to do the trial with 50-50 split of treatment versus control. And we also know, and that's why we've also stuck with ivermectin 
um, because we know it is effective. And if resistance does develop into the future, which I don't think is going to be possible through the work we're doing at this point in time, the level of sampling, um, then we do have other options of similar drugs, but with different, um, you know, less, we, we obviously change drug formulations when resistance develops. And so there are several other options that we can use into the future if we need to. Thank you. Um, question about capture. Yeah. Um, so I want to know the answer to this. So this yes. is why I'm asking it. Um, a couple of people have, have um, asked like, do you capture the pups while the mums are around? I imagine they're a little no, no, protected. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't do that for several reasons. One reason we would die. Um, these girls are so protective of their pups. It's probably, you know, something that's um, saved them really. Um, the females would eat us alive and chase. I mean, we've been chased on several occasions. Um, well, I won't even say several, more than several. Um, and so, no, we do not sample the pups when they're with their mums. Obviously, that would be a highly stressful um, situation. But what happens with these girls is, so they come on, come on shore, they give birth, then they stay on shore for about seven to ten days. During that time, they're mated by a male that has been waiting for his opportunity. So he basically, as soon as she comes out of the water, he lies right next to her and says, right, tell me when you're ready. Then she gets mated. And then at about day 10, after the pup's born, she goes to sea for two to three days to forage. Then she'll come back and stay on land for about two to three days to feed her pup, go to sea. And this is the pattern that develops over that 18-month period. And eventually, obviously, she will take her puppy out with her as well. So we sample pups when their mums are not on land. Um, and we are very careful about that. And we even have to be very careful about other mums because sometimes there's mums that decide they're going to protect every single pup in the vicinity. Um, and so we'll know that that mum is not, um, you know, that pup is not of that mum, but she might defend that pup. And at that point in time, we just retreat. We, yeah. we She's a not. strong auntie. She's yeah. going to look out too. <laughs> yeah. Cranky Jans, we call them. Yeah. We, we don't want to. Cranky wanna, Jans. Yeah. We don't. There's a lot of Cranky Jans at Dangerous Reef. Thankfully, not so much at Silver Bay. Um, a really interesting question came in about um, may, surrounding the physiological role that um, hookworms might have. Like, um, do they have any sort of role with the sea lions, like um, shaping the immune system or anything like that? Absolutely. So that's another component of the project that we're looking at. So um, we do know that in in humans, in 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 development of immunity in neonatal animals, shouldn't say animals, well, we are animals, in humans, that, um, you know, parasites and the microbiome are really heavily intertwined and that removing co-infectious agents such as a parasite can affect the microbiome. So part of the work that Mario Fulham is doing is she's actually comparing the microbiome development in the treated versus the non-treated pups. That's part of her PhD. Because obviously if we're gonna say, go and do this, it works, it's fantastic. We need to make sure there's not a negative impact of that, like the resistance, you know, developing resistance um, impact on the colony. So yeah, that's part of our work as well, is to actually look at the effect of removing hookworm, which obviously these animals have co-evolved co with from the system. And if that actually does impact, um, impact the normal microflora and also development of immunity, because it is really, the microbiome obviously and impacting that can be really significant in terms of immune development. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there was a question about um, so some of the impacts, I suppose, long term. Yeah. Um, do you see things like competition becoming a problem um, for sea lions if we are, you know, assisting their survival and their mortality rates go down? Um, are there other sorts of issues that might arise like competition? With other marine mammal species, do you mean? Um, fisheries and I th things? I think the question was related to competition within the species um, itself. So... Yeah, you know, they're pretty um, for resources. Right, okay. So um at the moment they're probably at quite low resource demand, but there is competition more between say the fur seal populations, so between Australian fur seals, New Zealand fur seals and the Australian sea lions, mm -hmm. because the fur seals have recovered amazingly um, from that historical sealing, whereas the sea lions haven't. So at the moment there probably is a bit of competition between the fur seals and the sea lions. Um, it's a little bit it's not something I guess I specifically look at. I don't think, I mean, when a species is endangered, I think we should 
be happy if we get an improvement in the population size. Um, but yeah, that there might come to a point. I mean, there's there's issues at the moment with fur seals and um, fisheries and things. So you know, there might. I I hope we get to a point where it's so successful that the population is recovering. That you know, there are issues with competition, but I think if anything, that will be a long way off. And it really is, you know. Hookworm's not the only threat to this population. There are so many different threats. This is just one small component that we can actually mitigate. And so that's, I guess, what we're at where we see our role is just mitigating that, that impact, which we do believe is quite significant. And we're also not advocating that we treat every single animal. We really are, this is really preliminary trials. This is what this is at. Um, we wanna see if there is a strategy that can be implemented if necessary. So if it gets, you know, for example, in um, New Zealand sea lions, they implemented ivermectin treatment in pups when there was a massive bacterial epidemic um, in a particular location. And basically they treated the pups for hookworms so that the immune system of the pups had less, less to work on so they could then fight that bacterial infection. So the, the premise of this is to really test whether we do have kind of a, a management strategy that can be employed in the future if it is deemed appropriate. And without doing proper clinical trials on it, um, I don't think we can ever be confident that it's safe and effective. So that's the purpose of what we're doing. Great, right, thank you. Um, just one more question, because I think this one is just really interesting. Knowing where your, uh, your field sites are, um, yep. what are the major challenges you face while carrying out this research? Mm -hmm. Apart from being chased down by a say, giant mums. sea lion. <laughs> yeah. Those females. Um, the females are probably one of the main challenges. Um, well, one thing that makes it really tricky to work on Australian sea lions is the non-annual reproduction. So pretty much anywhere in South Australia, there could be sea lions breeding. And I would love to go to every single site, but that's not possible. Um, and the, the five to nine month breeding season means that we have to pretty much go every month, at least two weeks a month to do this work, to actually achieve this, this sampling. Lot. And it's a really massive commitment. Um, and it also means that it's a, you know, we could go to, um, we could go to, you know, a first seal colony and we could sample 100 pups in three days. We go to do sea lion work and we can sample 100 pups across three or four months. Um, and then doing re recaptures. So it's really challenging. Um, danger, there, there is a danger element. Seal bay is pretty good. Um, but yeah, certainly females attacking us. Um, ter the terrain, I guess, is pretty challenging, and just the the effort that is required to actually pull off a trial like this is is um, pretty substantial. Yeah. Um, so I guess it sounds like it. Happens. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> full on. Yeah, but very, you know, we're pretty lucky. It's a pretty amazing place, and they're pretty beautiful animals. So yeah, we did have a few comments in there about how beautiful these oh, animals are so are. what They're a great beautiful. species you're working on yeah very that you know i mean fur seals are beautiful too but the sea lions i don't know they're just yeah just so special and so um yeah they're cheeky little things that's for sure that's great well dr rachel gray thank you so much for your talk today um you're we will wrap up now but um just to let everyone know there will be a recording of um of rachel's presentation and um, you can find that in the next few days at our website. So that's sydney.edu.au slash science. And um, don't miss the next Lifeage Box Science. We are going to have Associate Professor Jodie Webster with us on Wednesday, the 29th of July, same time, 12 p.m. And we're going to be learning some lessons from the geologic past. So uh, this talk will be on the evolution of the Great Barrier Reef uh, in response to some major environmental changes. So. Um, you can register for that now also at our website. Rachel, thank you once again for joining us. Oh, you're thanks, very welcome. Thanks everyone for tuning in today and we'll catch you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Thank you.